This is episode 23 of the Women in Depth podcast. The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome back to Women in Depth. Today's podcast episode actually grew out of interest from a previous episode, and that was episode 10 on spiritual abuse with Tamara Powell. Listeners contacted me saying that they wanted more, that they felt the episode could have gone longer, and they just had a lot of questions as far as what spiritual abuse could really look like, and how a person could become vulnerable to this, and also what were some of the long-term effects of experiencing spiritual abuse. So today, Tamara will be back on the podcast to go deeper with us into this topic, answering questions around what spiritual abuse can actually look like and how a person can be vulnerable to experiencing this type of abuse and what are some of the consequences a person may experience as a result of spiritual abuse. So without any further ado, let's jump into the interview. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, our guest is Tamara Powell. Tamara is a licensed mental health counselor and empowerment coach specializing in identity work, particularly issues related to sexuality and spirituality. In 2014, she opened ARIA Therapy Services in Pensacola, Florida, with a mission of bringing holistic and diversity-affirming therapeutic services to the Bible Belt. Since then, Tamara has expanded ARIA into a group practice and personally works with clients all over the world online. Most recently, Tamara created a tribe she calls Tales from a Trapezoid, dedicated to the more raw, intimate, an edgy side of being a trapezoid in a world full of circles. Hi, Tamara, and welcome back. Hi, Lourdes. Excited to be here. I am excited to have you back as well. We had so much feedback from our first conversation on spiritual abuse that we are doing a part two. Yay! (laughs) So just for the listeners who didn't catch part one, could you share a little bit more about yourself and your work? Sure. I am in my late 30s. I'm a mom to two girls who are now about to be 11 and 13. So puberty is big in our house right now. Oh boy. To, yeah, navigate two little women who are coming up through this planet. As you mentioned, I own Aria Therapy Services. So I see clients every day, both in person and online. And my specialties include sexuality and spirituality, including the topic we're talking about today, spiritual abuse. So just to dive right in, Tamara, I wanted to recap what we talked about the last time to bring our listeners up to speed. And so one of the things that we just started off with was kind of just, you know, what is spiritual abuse? So could you just maybe really quickly give a, I guess, a brief definition or descriptor of what it is? Absolutely. Um, Spiritual abuse is pretty much like any other type of abuse in that We have physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, all of those types of things. Anytime that we dehumanize another person, that's considered abuse. And so if someone is dehumanizing another individual in the name of God or religion, I consider that spiritual abuse. That's probably the most basic explanation I could give you. And when you spoke last time about um, how spiritual abuse can damage a person's worldview, Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? I mean the way that you literally view the world. So all of us from a psychological perspective tend to have a lens. It's kind of like going to the ophthalmologist when they do one of those vision tests and they say lens one or lens two. Um, (laughs) You can't help but have a lens. Cognitive psychologists would call those schemas, right? Um, I also liken it to a scrapbook. And so spiritual abuse kind of takes your scrapbook and completely screws with it, shreds it, (laughs) turns it upside down, and changes the way that you look at yourself, those around you, and the world in general. It can often become a very scary place. Everything you thought you held to be true, now you're not so sure about. 
And probably if you never really had a chance to get to know your own worldview or develop your own worldview, it can be difficult to even get to a place to realize that that has been taken from you. Right. If you grew up in a rigid dogmatic system from birth on, you probably had no idea that your worldview was literally handed to you. You didn't have to think critically about it. So a lot of the victims that I see in my office, that's one of the first signs that I pick up on is that they have no idea how to even make a decision for themselves. So really, um, when you think of worldview, it's not just the way that they look at the world. It's the way that they move through the world, the way they, mm-hmm. the way they will um, structure their choices, their experiences, um, their relationships. Right. So our brain interprets the information coming in, and from there we make decisions on how we want to interact with other people or even ourselves. So our emotions and our behaviors are definitely going to be affected as well. So pretty, pretty huge impact. You know, yeah, it cannot be overstated. <laughs> so today we were going to dig a little deeper. Uh, there were questions from, from listeners. And, you know, one of them was really getting more clarity on, on what spiritual abuse is in the sense of the form it can happen in. I think there were questions around, does it just happen in an organized religion? You know, those types of questions. Mm -hmm. So Tamara, maybe we can start with sharing how spiritual abuse can actually look like, the forms that it can take shape and how almost like the costumes or the outfits someone puts on. If someone's experiencing spiritual abuse, what does it look like and what does it feel like? Sure. So it certainly can happen in absolutely any sort of faith or group system whatsoever, not just Christianity. Christianity gets a pretty bad rap because it's one of the most visible. The Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism tend to be still the ones with the most amount of followers. And so it's probably easiest to pick up on those. But I have seen people come in from all sorts of different worldviews, including even ones that are not talked about pretty frequently like Santeria, Candoble, Ifa, Mormonism, Scientology, and the signs of abuse tend to run the same gamut, which would be things like overly rigid thinking, um, people in authority telling you what you can and cannot do to the point where they are threatening you with eternal damnation, either knowingly or sometimes unknowingly simply by way of their own worldviews. Other things that I have seen would be like passive aggressive comments trying to get people to volunteer past hours that would be burnout, fatigue, um, certainly donating money to the point where people cannot afford to pay for their own groceries or light bills, all sorts of things. Basically anything that robs a person of their personhood the way that we would think of other abuse. And so those, some of the things that you just described, those are how it can happen, how, how someone can be spiritually abused. Right. Some of the common warning signs, keys that they might know that they might be at risk for being abused. And I would think that one of those two could be just that sense of um, the threat or the experience of being excluded or exiled. From the Absolutely. Group. That's the threat that's held above their heads. Again, whether consciously or subconsciously, any worldview or group because almost I would want to kind of plant the seed that spiritual abuse could even take place in non-theistic ideologies even an agnostic group or an atheistic group can still have spiritual implications and exclusivity from the group is a terrible thought and I think, too, that part of it is, you know, for especially for someone who's been spiritually abused and has kind of been pulled into that cycle of abuse, just like domestic violence, the, the longer a person is being abused, the more abuse that they have experienced. And depending on the, the depth and the extremity of the abuse, it's harder and harder to pull out despite how traumatic it is. Absolutely. We start to see things like learned helplessness take place. Um, and victim blaming, internalized shame. And so facing what that would mean leaving is almost too much for someone to bear. And that's where we see suicidality. And so when you're talking about this happening in different places, not just the Mm -hmm. um, theistic um, Mm -hmm. organizations, this can also happen, um, like you were saying, like even in some of the more, what we would call um, 
maybe new agey or benign places? Oh, yes. I have many. (laughs) (laughs) Slides have to be uh, very firm and and emphatic on that one. Um, Ask any yogi who's been part of the yoga culture for a while. You start to see, I mean, narcissism can take place anywhere. You can start to see gurus who end up saying, you know, this is the only way to do Shavasana or you have to absolutely (laughs) explain the asanas by their proper titles when we're going through them. And we've seen people fall prey to places that are supposed to be absolutely full of love and warmth and light and gifting everyone with their own path. But suddenly their own path starts to look a hell of a lot like the guru's path. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I think with a lot of these organizations, especially if someone um, begins to be involved in them, I think when they're older, Mm -hmm. um, the organization similar again to domestic violence begins to isolate them from others like their family, friends, loved ones who might show concern or disagree with the spiritual or religious involvement that they're experiencing. Absolutely. And it's slow and insidious. It's kind of like that old analogy of bringing a frog to boil. You (laughs) put the frog straight in hot water, it's going to jump right out. But If you slowly entice it and turn it up degree by degree by degree, it's not going to notice until it's too late. So what are some of the factors that you think make a person vulnerable to being spiritually abused? And this would be someone maybe who, you know, it's not happening since birth and they weren't born into this. This is where it's hard for me as a clinician even to talk about sometimes because I just want to give everyone a giant warm hug. It's not about pathologizing anyone per se. It's not about further blaming. And I sometimes see people who come into my office, office excuse me, have a hard time even taking a look at how the hell did I end up here? It's not, and then that's where that frog analogy comes back into play. It's wasn't an overnight thing. So certainly people, though, who have had a history of trauma in their background, being hurt, being excluded by other people, people who have been taught to respect authority at all costs, people who may have had situations where learned helplessness would be an easy go-to, people who struggle to be assertive or independent. So again, it's not about blaming the followers or type B personalities or introverts or even sometimes extroverts. It really doesn't matter because it could go either way. Um, If you think about it, an extrovert would be drawn to a group simply for that social support and an introvert would be drawn to same said group for social support. <laughs> it's just right. what they're getting from that group might be very different things. But at the end of the day, the group provides norms that they might not have had elsewhere. And I think also, even though it's um, abusive, also just a place to belong and connection. And for many of the descriptors that you, you mm-hmm. provided, you know, just factors that make someone more vulnerable um, to belong, to be accepted, to, to be connected in any way is better than the alternative. Absolutely. So we talked a little bit about this in the previous episode, but what are some of the ways fundamentalism in any religion impairs clients psychologically? Fundamentalism, and I'm glad we're having this conversation because Oftentimes, clinicians who do talk about spiritual abuse, such as myself, get labeled as being anti-God, anti-spirituality, anti-church, and that's not at all the case. There are a lot of healthy spiritualities out there, in my opinion, to include any number of even what other people call cults, because it's not about that. To me, spirituality is about what prompts someone to higher self-actualization, and so it is important to differentiate between fundamentalism and when it goes awry and just spirituality in general. And we saw fundamentalism really start to take root in the early 1900s in the United States after a series of booklets that was published where modern church leaders, and here I am talking about Christianity, started fearing the effects of what they thought were modern trends, 
so to speak, potentially watering down the Christian message as a way of making it more palatable. So they were afraid that by going along with the times and what their generations at that time wanted, we were somehow going to do away with the overarching message of Christianity, and it would somehow destroy their integrity. And so fundamentalism became a rallying cry for kind of sticking to obviously the fundamentals, the things like the Bible or any other sacred text. Is again, this you could be a fundamentalist Muslim, you could be a fundamentalist follower of Ifa, um, but basically it's where we start to see overly rigid dogma and exclusivity, what you were talking about before, like not deviating from the group, not leaving the group, the group having the only answer, um, and you have to do it this way, and what we know from a psychological standpoint is that then provides group norms and group think, and that can go way awry, even by the most well-intended groups. Nobody sets out to end up looking like Zimbardo's prison experiment, but put people under the right circumstances and we can absolutely end up with an us against them mentality. And so we start to see intense fears around anything that goes outside of these now developed group norms. So from Christianity, oftentimes you'll hear things like nothing quote unquote secular, which means nothing that we don't agree with. No drinking, no dancing, so no secular music. When I was growing up, we weren't even allowed to watch PG rated movies because there could be magic in it. And magic was equivalent to witchcraft, even if it was just the gummy bears. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Potter. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's so funny because it just made me think of some of my own personal experience where, you know, yoga was considered and meditation. Oh my God, you were just, that was a gateway to Satan himself. <laughs> yeah, and even meditation. Yes, you know, that was also opening a yourself up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you, you mentioned something that I found really um, interesting, you said that, you know, spirituality is anything that motivates or leads a person to higher self actualization. And I wanted you to maybe tell our listeners what self-actualization is in case they are not aware of what that means. That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> it depends upon your definition of is. So certainly Maslow's hierarchy is pretty well known. I'm talking about anything that takes a human being past what I would call the basic levels of personhood. So we're not just talking about surviving anymore. We're not just talking about having positive thinking and keeping your emotions in check, but actually taking it a step further to feeling not only a sense of purpose and meaning in the world, but a sense of giving back to humanity, legacy, things that really seem to round out a person's experience here on the planet, things that promote self-growth, things that take us past our everyday nine to five grind. So it's almost like, you know, it's what takes a person beyond themselves. It connects them to others, to the world, to, um, to a greater purpose, just really kind of transcends the everyday. That's a beautiful way of putting it, yes. Okay. I think that that's a really beautiful way to describe spirituality. Mm -hmm. And when you hear it that way, it's very encompassing. Right. It can include taking a walk in nature or that meditation <laughs> <laughs> or yoga or even just a really good conversation with other people. There are times when I'm sitting with clients that I feel a deep spiritual connection. It's something that Rogers called presence and intuition in the room. It's interesting because, um, you know, what you're describing is the exact opposite of what happens in spiritual abuse, which is that disconnection from oneself from others from one's own knowing from trusting your intuition mm -hmm. absolutely so what are some of the long-term and short-term i guess consequences of spiritual abuse i know we've talked about you know it's the person's worldview but if you were to break it down into what that mm -hmm. could actually look like in a person's lived experience Sure. So I think it does affect us on every level of being. So for example, cognitively, spiritual abuse takes away someone's ability to think critically for themselves, like I mentioned before, because we are told that this leader or this faith system has 
all of the answers for us, even if it goes against what our inner intuition is telling us. It can cause anxiety disorders because if somebody's attempting to be perfect or do it the right way, so to speak, we can start to see things like OCD-like features where um, a person gets overly obsessed with meeting a certain standard and then when they don't meet it, the compulsions become ever stronger, which then can lead to a whole host of issues, as I'm sure you can imagine. We start to see things like depression. We start to feel shame when we're not living up to the standards that this leader or this worldview tells us we are supposed to because human beings, as we know, while wonderful and from my opinion, inherently full of worth, we still screw up from time to time. Life gets messy and it is absolutely inevitable that we are going to quote unquote sin or have a human moment. And so if your worldview tells you that that's not possible or that uh, you should ever be striving for perfection, you're going to naturally feel shame. Go ahead. Yeah, it's just it's like a, it can really be just a setup to fail because it's not possible to, um, to not sin, to not be human, to, to live life and and have all kinds of experiences from, you know, just to use these words t- to show a continuum, but good, bad, and everything in between, you know that that's part of the, the human experience, and I can see how religion and spirituality can take that normal, beautiful, flawed experience and, and make it uh, something to really struggle with because you can't, you can't be. You know? Right. And as opposed to a healthy spirituality that would allow for that continuum and allow for self-actualization of experiencing the, the dark, so to speak, or the messy side of life, what it does is it ends up becoming this measuring stick that you can't live up to and you end up getting beaten with it energetically. (laughs) Now I've heard, um, you know, I've heard said from different people that, you know, spiritual abuse or religious abuse is, is not really a thing that it's just something that is made up and that, you know, anyone can experience any type of dissatisfaction or (laughs) conflict around something. And suddenly it's an, it's abuse. What would you say to that? (laughs) <laughs> that's Cameron. like I know. <laughs> Besides, <laughs> you giggle because that's like blaming you know the donut for a person who who binge eats. You know, it's like saying, well, let's not call it an eating disorder, even though this person is clearly showing symptoms of all of these other traits. So to me, that just sounds like a hell of a lot more victim blaming and. Growing up in a more dogmatic faith myself, I can absolutely attest to that idea that, you know, there are no broken churches, just broken people. I have to say bullshit. It's just, <laughs> no, and that just keeps people stuck. I tend to think that that frequently comes from other people who are struggling with cognitive dissonance themselves. And it's not about asking people to walk away from a faith system, but about walking away from something that does not serve them and their highest good. So for anyone who may be wondering if they are experiencing spiritual abuse Uh or or know that they are experiencing it, what are some, you know, words of wisdom that you would offer to them if they're listening right now? First, that it's important to get still and quiet. And as I would go back to your last question, the proof is going to be in the pudding. Are you feeling excited or even any sort of warmth or anticipation towards attending church or attending your groups or reading your Bible or whatever sacred text that is, that is key to you. If not, then it is at least worth looking into. Is there perhaps some sort of manipulation causing you to want to pull away that whole separation that we keep talking about? That should not be part of any sort of group system, nor should you be feeling frequent experiences of shame or depression or anxiety. I tend to ask people to look for things like that quote unquote wretch theology or worm theology, as I call it, you know, it's amazing that God could love a wretch like you. Wow. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) that doesn't, that just make you want to jump up out of bed and and go to church. Yeah. Um, 
So if there's any sort of that where you're feeling the need to pull away from either other people in your life or from yourself, I think you would, it would behoove you to take a look. I love how you really um, bring the focus onto paying attention to the feelings that are coming up for them mm -hmm. and that those feelings are messengers with uh, really important you know, messages for them to listen to and to offer direction. I, I also love that wretch theology. <laughs> That's my thing. <laughs> That's what I've come to call it. I don't know what other people call it. That's yeah. just where things go wrong. Anytime that someone's made to feel like a wretch, that's probably an issue. Yeah, that's a good red flag. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tamara, thank you so much for coming back on and doing part two from spiritual abuse and how therapy can help and just a little bit more information that you might find meaningful in your journey. So thanks so much, Tamara. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Tamara. One of the things that stood out for me is how with spirituality, true spirituality, there is a sense of connection. Connection to oneself, connection to the community, connection to the world, connection to nature. And with spiritual abuse, there is a definite sense of separation, disconnection, and even isolation. I also appreciated that Tamara made the distinction that spiritual abuse can happen anywhere. This is not something that is reserved for organized religions. It can happen in a yoga studio, it can happen in a Buddhist practice. And so I just wanted to really emphasize that this is not about stereotyping or making assumptions that spiritual abuse happens only in certain religious or spiritual practices. For show notes to today's episode, please visit www.lourdesviado.com forward slash women in depth. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. Thank you so much for listening and see you next time.